the impact it can make, both positive as well as negative. And in the digital age, with the digital communication, everyone, in fact in our country, the number of a smartphone holder is more than the population of the country. So there are people who have more than one smartphone. You can imagine the power of the digital media. It has helped in democratization of the media, the information. It has liberated the media or the ch channel of information from the powerful and rich lobbies because you don't need too much of infrastructure and yet you can reach the largest number of viewers, the readers. Now this is the impact, I'm sure, but, but for the digital, I'm not sure whether Rupande would have been able to launch a media channel because the amount of resources it needs. We all know the crucial significance of media in a democracy. The well-informed citizenry is the strength, is an asset to democracy. And to keep the, the people informed and properly informed is the responsibility of the media. Today, we all know that the politics is all pervasive and every political entity is competing for the eyeballs of the people. The fight for the soul of common man is on, unrestrained. And in this battle, each one trying to catch the eyeball of the common man and win over the soul, you have countless, you have a flood of information or flood of something which is being dissed out in the name of information. Media has a great responsibility. Great responsibility to inform the people with truthful news and well-reasoned views. Because it's not just the information, but it's also the context that matters. When a viewer or a reader sees or reads a piece of information or development, unless the context is given, the right con proper context, it is likely to be misconstrued in multiple ways. It can evoke emotions instead of reason. And when it invokes or when it evokes it emotions, it can play havoc. We have seen even in the recent past. And we have been witnessing it time and again. The evocative power of media, especially the digital media, because it reaches past and reaches the farthest and the widest range of audience. We have witnessed flash rags, flash floods, I mean flash uh, law and order situations, panic reactions, people running away, creating havocs, disrupting the normal life. It can be disruptive. And so, this, this medium 
is to be used with a great sense of responsibility. Its commitment to truth is of course non-negotiable, should be non-negotiable. Unfortunately, because the power it wields at times, those running these houses, they drift away from their responsibility. At times, it becomes, it appears, becoming a propaganda instrument to promote someone. Now, this is an aberration. I think we must guard against. It has responsibility to the society and responsibility to the nation. When we talk about or when we think about media's social and national responsibilities, when we go back we find in the past, they were great people, great media people, great journalists, those who acquitted themselves so, so well in both the areas, social responsibility as well as national responsibilities. One such name strikes me prominently is our Bhartiya. Now Bhartiya, the way in a short span of life, he, as if his life was a campaign, campaign to take the social cause as well as the national cause. I had the fortune to read some of his writings. Of course, I am yet to grasp fully what, what he wrote in Tamil. I am sure he must have written far more powerfully in, those, in, the, in the language. Because after all, it is a very, very powerful language, very, very rich language. But recently, Hindu had published a, a compendium of his writings to Hindu. And when I read this, one gets a goosebump. Look at the issues that he raised. Social issues, caste discrimination, social discrimination, gender discrimination, untouchability, access to temples. He campaigned against all, the dis all these discriminations very powerfully. And when the British tried to kill the sense of selfhood of our people by imposing the English language, and one of the writings of Bhartiyar, which I read in response to, then there was a principal of one of the well-known colleges of Chennai, J.C. Rawl. J.C. British were trying to uh, to not only promote, but in a way keep Tamil to the primary level and all the subsequent, ed subsequent education only in English, saying that English was the only way to uplift the people to keep them educated, to make them educated. J.C. Rawl made a very powerful argument, not exactly powerful in substance, but he tried to. He was articulating what the British imperialists were trying to do. And at that point of time, Bhartiya's response was remarkable in defense of Tamil language. He said that, look, Mr. Rawl, he calls him by name, look, you are mistaken. You are underplaying the rich literature of Tamil right from the Sangam period. Right from the view, if you look at the vastness and richness of it, it is the mother tongue that sh should be and that must be the medium of education. <laughs> at that point of time, standing up to the British, coming up with a cogent, coherent, and powerful argument in defense of the language when the language was under threat. 
it's a different thing that there are some people today sitting at very high positions, they still, they openly, they publicly admit, and they say they, they canvas the British rule was a blessing. But for the British, but for the British, Tamil people would not have been educated. There would not have been education in Tamil. This is mental, this is colonization of the mind. But Bhartiya, how powerful he took it. And it was, it, had, it was impactful. And when she came to the national freedom, of course, we all know what all it did. So, discharging the response, social and national responsibilities the way he did should be an example, should be an inspiration for us today. There were many, there are many media houses started by very stalwart, well-meaning people, committed people, committed to the cause of the society and the nation. But somehow over the period, over the time, it drifts. It tends to drift, after all, we are human beings. So, the responsibility that Chanakya would have and the challenge that, that they would face in future is to keep it, to keep its compass correct, poised. Today it has earned the credibility, it has earned the trust because of its truthfulness, its impartiality and its commitment to the cause of the society and the nation. It needs to keep itself and its team reminding time and again. Because there is a saying that it is easy to build a road, difficult to maintain it. It is easy to build a new channel. It is difficult to keep root, it rooted to its, its values. I am sure so long Sri Pandey is around, it will not deviate, it will keep the compass ready. At a time, Today, when it comes in the contemporary world, contemporary time, we have a large number of social issues also. We have untouchability, we have deprivation, we have poverty, we have hunger in this very state of Tamil Nadu. These are, when at the macro level things look bright and beautiful, but when we look at the micro level, there are issues. We have very, now and then, we hear the story of untouchability. We hear the story how some people are being denied access to the temple. We also know how educational standard in our, our government schools are going down. Today, in fact, I was going through the CAZ report. I was sh shocked that over 73% of our children of Tamil Nadu in high and higher secondary school, they go to private school. Only, only 27% children, they go to government school. Even though we have a wide network of government school and our government teachers are paid well. Why? There is a decline in the values. I think this is, these are cause of worries. Because this, this society, the country cannot grow if we have some of our people left behind. We cannot afford to have imbalances in the society. We cannot afford to have imbalances in the regions. The change that is being experienced by the country today, at the country level, is fundamentally because the way now the country is being looked at and the problems of countries are being looked at. The country which was looked at earlier in terms of regions, different, 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 different states. The states are there, they are, they are, they are respected. But what used to happen in the planning? We used to have our five-year planning. And in the five-year planning, there were limited resources, the state, smarter states would be able to get more resources, less smart would not be able to get resources. And as a result, the development was Darwinian. Survival of the smarter. And even the smarter one, there were a lot of sub-regional imbalances, as we see here in our state, which otherwise is, is pretty high in terms of, if you go by, the, by education, health, and infrastructure, industry, in all these matters, our state has done wonderfully. 
But when you look at the, at the micro level, you have su such sub-regional imbalances. And when we look at the social level, we have deprivations. And we have social discriminations. So the looking at the country in terms of regions, in terms of states, in terms of sub-regions, that's not a complete, a, a appropriate way to look at. Now, presently, today, the country is looked at as a family, as a one member, Warukutumbam. That is how we look at the country. And that is why all the, all the, the necessary ingredients of a healthy citizenship, whether it comes education, whether it comes health, whether it comes access to potable water, drinking water, whether it comes to electricity, all these, there is no discrimination between a person whether located in Tamil Nadu or Tripura. The schemes are all homogeneous. Ayushman Bharat does not discriminate between a person here or a person there. Everyone has access. And with the digital revolution that we have, now the, the laws, the, the transmission laws that used to happen, as one Prime Minister said that in one rupee only 15 paisa goes to the I'm a beneficiary, 85 passage, a siphoned off. That doesn't happen today. That we look at the country as a family, not in terms of various divisions. And the problem of the country also is not looked at in terms of addressing it in piecemeal. Because when we, in the, in the last 70, 75 years, we did build roads, we did build schools, we did build hospitals. But we addressed, continued addressing the problem piecemeal. We didn't try to address the problem comprehensively. As a result, while we kept addressing the problem, problem also kept multiplying, and we remained the country with a dubious distinction of hosting the largest number of Sikh, hungry, illiterate. Look at this sanitation. We had the distinction of dubious distinction, I must say, of more than 55% of people going for open defecation. And people thought that, why? What is this? It is cultural, cultural trait. It won't. You, 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 you can't address it. It is not possible. It happened. Now, it is all that change that we are, happy, we are witnessing, the positive change that we are witnessing in our country, is fundamentally because we look at the country as a family. And the problem when it comes, the problem cannot be said that in my, if I have in my family certain number of members, a problem faced by one member of the family is not the problem of that member alone, it is the problem of the entire family, we have to address it. Now, with this, of this outlook, when the country is moving forward, and today we have the distinction of being the fastest growing large economy in the world. We have, we are among the fastest e startup ecosystem in the world. The world looks at India with a lot of expectation, with a lot of ex hope. Expectation and hope when India rises is of a different nature than what, when the other countries rose. In the past, we all know, when Europe rose, they became imperialists, so they colonized the world. And that, that we, were, we were colonized, and it inflicted enormous suffering to the people. We suffered. The rest, rest of the world suffered. When US and USSR rose, both of these, in pursuit of their ideology, they devastated the world, killed millions of people. One in pursuit of democracy, so-called, another in, in sort of pursuit of their ideology. When China began rising, soon, Countries, those who came close to them, they realized what a trap they had placed them. This was hegemonistic right. Rise. But when India rises, it brings happiness to the world. When the latest COVID is an example, when the COVID has struck, nobody was spared. The whole world was affected. Nobody knew the way out. And at that point of time, when the rich countries, advanced countries, developed the vaccines, there was a hope that perhaps out of concern, humanitarian concern, they would be sharing the vaccine with the rest of the world, with the less privileged. But that didn't happen. They looked at it as an opportunity to make money. Prices of vaccine went. When, thanks to our doctors, thanks to our scientists, when we invented vaccine, 
and now the vaccine, our vaccine has been proved to be one of the best. We gave vaccine. India gave vaccine free of cost to over 150 countries in the world. Now this is our sanskar, this is our DNA. When we say Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, when we say the world is a family, it is not a political slogan. This is, this is our, in our DNA, this is our sanskar, which has been given to us for several thousand years. This is Sanatan sanskar that we have. And so when India rises, the rest of the world, especially the less privileged one, they look up to it with a lot of hope. Today, two-thirds of the humanity, which we call Global South, is looking upon India as its voice, as their voice. At this point of time, when our country is moving forward, the media has a very, very important role. You know, it's up to, in every society, in every community, every individual, you have positive and negative. No one is a perfect saint, no one is a perfect sinner. It's a mix. Now if we keep building on the negatives, the negatives acquires momentum. It drags the energy, it, it, it retards the growth, it demoralizes the people. Now other, some days back, some newspaper carried a, in broad news, someone said, if Tamil language dies, Tamil race will die. I was, I wondered, with 90 million, 9 crore proud speaker, Tamil speaker, with 140 crore proud admirers, with such a thousands years of rich heritage from Sangam downward, is it possible? Can anyone even imagine that Tamil language will ever die? But then, but then when someone says to evoke the fear, and when media gives it a prominent cover, I really wonder, is it a responsible reporting? I think we need, we, I mean especially, I'm talking about the media, it has a great responsibility. It must filter the chaff and the grain, the fact and the fearful fiction. It must be separated. We must add up to the positive energy of the society. Today, if we have from the five, less than 500 startup, in less than eight to nine years, we have nearly about 100,000 startup. It is because of the courage and confidence of our young men and women. This is because of the positivity that we have been able to generate and the trust that we have been able to generate in our young men and women that they are bringing this result, incredible results. And the world is looking upon India as the hub of science and technology. I think at this point of time, in our national journey, media too has a great responsibility. We have, and now that we know that in the Amrit Kal, in the next 25 years, the country would be celebrating centenary of independence. And by that time, in fact, four years short of that, Chanakya would be celebrating the Silver Jubilee. Now that Silver Jubilee, here, this team will also ask a question and feel happy if they have contributed to the building of the nation. Because it is a responsibility of all of us, of course more so on the media. We are privileged. We are privileged to be a witness to this radical and revolutionary transformation that is happening in the country. And we are also fortunate to be a participant in it, to be the agent of change, each one of us. And so there might be hundreds and thousands of media channels, digital media channels or otherwise, but Chanakya, I am sure, will stand true to its name and the way it has laid the foundation and it is moving forward commitment to the truth, 
commitment to the cause of the society and the nation. I wish Chanakya all the very best in the long, long journey and all the members of the team the very best. My warm wishes, greetings to all of you. Thank you very much. Jai Bharat.